around to 8 o'clock. Slowly get started. There's some people show up. I guess I'll start off with the attendance reminders. Obviously, Friday's attendance was a little bit odd compared to the way we usually do it because I didn't post questions. And I've just decided not to post questions. So that last announcement that I sent, that's just the way the attendance will be for Friday. You just need to watch the video and then send me the keywords. Take a screenshot when I say the keywords as, as proof. And that's it. Um, normally, you know, if you don't have that done before the next class period, you're considered late. But considering that was an exam review, I'm not going to, there will be no late penalty for that. As long as you have it done before the exam, which is a week from today, then you're good. So make sure you get that done. Let me know if you have questions about that. Today's first word for attendance will be Texas, since someone mentioned earlier that they were happy that Texas won against WVU today. So the first word for attendance is Texas. Yes, sir. What does that mean you just said? Hmm? What does that mean you just said? Oh, just for the uh, attendance for Friday. So if you missed, you know, if you weren't here and you haven't sent the keywords yet, then yeah, send the keywords. That's it for attendance. Any questions about attendance? All right, again, like I said, the exam is a week from today. It's going to cover chapters five, six, and seven. Um, yeah, it's just going to be like the first one. It'll be online. You can turn it in by 8.50. You're going to lose 10 points for a minute that you're late. Um, and if you want to do it sometime before then, let me know. We can arrange that. Any questions about the exam? All right. That's it for the announcements. Well, I guess I'll remind you, too, that lab is an online lab this week. So we're not going to physically meet in person. We're going to meet Wednesday online. Um, but, you know, I recommend doing the lab before then if you can. Um, because if you do good enough, then after I grade it, I'll send you a message and say, hey, you don't need to show up online on Wednesday because you're done. So unless you hear otherwise from me, be online at noon for lab. Any questions about that? All right, that's all for the announcements. Let's jump into the new material. You know, oops. So to remind you, in chapter one, we talked about the properties of life. <coughs> There's eight of them. The one we just covered for the last uh, three chapters in this next exam is energy, right? Life needs energy. Life transforms energy from one form to the other. That's what we learned about. This one, I would say this next exam is basically going to be about reproduction. Life reproduces. And that's what we're going to learn about. So let's start off. We're talking about cellular reproduction, by the way. Um, I think most people are pretty familiar with just reproduction, right? So usually when people think of reproduction, they think of a male and a female getting together and having a baby, right? That's human reproduction, but we are talking about cellular reproduction. Just like last time when we talked about cellular respiration, that was just different than regular respiration, right? Usually when people think of respiration, they just think of breathing in, right? Getting air into your lungs and breathing out. And that's not what that was. We were talking about cellular respiration, which was related to that, but different. So this is the same way. Cellular reproduction is related to what you might think of as reproduction, but it's not quite the same. Anyway, any idea? Well, first of all, can anybody tell me what this molecule, molecule is? Surely you've seen it before. You've probably seen different drawings of it, though. No, no one wants to guess what that is? DNA. Yes, it's DNA. So any idea why there's a picture of this DNA molecule right next to this lady? What, what do you think your textbook might be getting at there? Not that I expect you to know. I'm just curious. It's not important, but your book points out that if you were to take the DNA and just one of your cells and stretch it out, it would be six feet long. About, you know, it's a little bit different. You can look it up for independent work if you want to know uh, exactly how tall it is. Actually, your book says, if stretched out, the DNA in any one of your cells would be taller than you. That's what it says. So you can look that up for independent work. Exactly how tall is it? And think about that. That's just one of your cells. And think about how many cells you have. So if you were to take all your DNA and stretch it out, imagine how long that would be. And you probably look that up for independent work as well. Does anybody know what these things are? You will need to know what these are. But chromosomes, good. Those are chromosomes. Um, and your book says, Keeping track of chromosomes during cell division is vital. Duplicating the wrong number of chromosomes is almost always fatal. So what we have here is an extra chromosome. And as you'll learn in this chapter, sometimes that is fatal. 
and you don't want extra chromosomes. At least not with humans. How about this one? This one's a little bit more tough. Can anybody, well, first of all, without getting specific, what are we looking at here? Not just that, but this whole thing. Yeah, it's an x ray, right? Of a chest. Now, if you want to get a little bit more specific, can anybody guess what that is? It's a little bit hard. It's a tumor. So, in this chapter, you're going to learn about what causes cancer, basically, what causes tumors on the most basic levels. But still, um, like I said, when we started this semester, I said you're going to learn some stuff that's very important in your life. Um, and it's a 100 level class, so we're not going to get that deep. But in your life, like if you ever know somebody who has cancer, or you yourself ever get this cancer, and you have to do some research to find out you know, exactly what kind of cancer you have, and what are the treatment options, and what's the prognosis, well, you won't be starting from scratch, right? Because you're going to learn the basics in this chapter. Anyway, none of that's going to be on the exam, obviously, but are there any questions about this slide? Well, you brought up uh, Stephen Wright about the independent work. That independent work. Can we talk about like movements in sports too? Like for sports movements? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You mean physically? How can you yeah. move? Yeah. yeah. So, any questions about this? All right. Um, your book always starts off with this the biology and society part. I always skip it. I'm never going to test you on it. You could read about it. It is, it is interesting. It's about something called parthenogenesis. Um, it's basically when females reproduce, they basically clone themselves. If you've ever seen Jurassic Park, that's how that happened, right? The first Jurassic Park. They're like, no, no, we're safe. This, everybody, they're all, all the dinosaurs are females. There's nothing to worry about. But they didn't take into consideration that sometimes females can clone themselves. So good independent work topic. Obviously, this one's about a shark. This happens with other species, too, if you want to look into it. By all means. Here we go. Now we're finally getting into the important stuff. This chapter is going to be three main bullet points. The first thing you're going to learn is what cellular reproduction accomplishes. Because again, that's what this <coughs> chapter is, right? This chapter is about cellular reproduction. So you're going to learn what it accomplishes. And then you're going to learn about the cell cycle and mitosis. And then you're going to learn about meiosis. So this is all the stuff that's on this week's lab. So let's jump into it. Reproduction, as you probably already know, basically two types. I've already hinted at it. The one I think most people think of when you use the word reproduction is this first bullet point. May result in the birth of new organisms. So again, I think when you're not in a biology class, if you were to say, well, my cousin is reproducing, <laughs> you would mean, probably, right, your cousin is having a baby with their significant other. Well, hopefully their significant other. But yeah, that's the one type of reproduction. The other type, the one we're going to talk a little bit more about, is the second bullet point. It involves the production of new cells. Actually, I forgot. Usually I start this off, this uh, chapter off by asking a question. That's kind of ruined it, but I'll try it anyway. How many of you have reproduced? And you should all be raising your hands because of this second bullet point. More often, it involves the production of new cells. When your dad's sperm combined with your mom's egg, at that point in your life, you were one cell, right? How many of you are one big cell right now? None of you, right? Because you've gone through cellular reproduction. So you have gone through reproduction. As a matter of fact, you are reproducing right now, most likely. The second bullet point. Now, those of you online, you might be doing the first bullet point. I don't know what you're doing. But for those of us in person, you know, you're probably doing the second bullet point right now. Anyway, when a cell undergoes reproduction, the process leads us to two daughter cells. Right? So you start with one cell, and then you end with two daughter cells. I'm not necessarily going to ask you that on the. Let me do that. I'm not going to necessarily ask you that on the exam. It's just that when you oops, I'm going to cross the daughter. That's the important part. It's just that when you hear me say daughter cells, I just want you to know what I'm saying. So when I say daughter cells, that's what I mean. Right? We started with one cell. Now we have two daughter cells. That's what daughter cells mean. It doesn't mean it's a female cell, right? So I'm a male. And as I go through cellular reproduction, I'll start with one cell, and then I'll end with two daughter cells. So even though I'm a male, I have different daughter cells. Don't let that confuse you. Something else you need to know, and I'm going to talk about this later, so there's no need to write it down yet. But when we go through cellular reproduction, cell division, the two daughter cells are genetically identical to each other and genetically identical to the parent cell. So when that parent cell basically duplicates itself, everything is identical. Genetically identical. Of course, mistakes happen. Um, 
So this isn't 100% accurate, but we'll talk about that later. Any questions about this slide? All right. Before the cell divides, it has to do some stuff. A lot of stuff. And you can look this up for independent work because mostly what we're going to talk about in this chapter is what the chromosomes do. So this whole story, for the most part, is all about the chromosomes. But you have to think, obviously cells are going through a lot of stuff when they reproduce. But we don't talk about all that. So if you want to look it up for independent work, you can look at what else do cells do when they reproduce. <clears throat> that being said, let's get back to this. So the chromosomes have to duplicate, because what you want, again, like I said on that last bullet point, the daughter cells are genetically identical to the parent cell. So the parent cell is making a perfect copy of itself. So to do that, well, genetically, it's making a perfect genetic copy of itself. So to do that, it has to be able to perfectly duplicate the chromosomes. And then once it's done that, then it can finally do cell division. And when that happens, each daughter cell receives one identical set of chromosomes from the lone original parent cell. So this one slide is basically talking about half of what we're going to learn in this chapter. So if you take notes, there's nothing to write down here because, again, we're going to go into detail for, the, for this. This is just a basic statement of what we're about to talk about. But definitely know what chromosomes are. That's an important word. Um, yeah, any questions about this, this slide? All right, the second word for attendance will be the one I'm circling right now. I'm just going to circle it and I won't say it. That is the second word for attendance. The one I had just circled, for those of you online. Any questions about this? All right. Cell so division plays the li roles in the lives of organisms. Basically, it does three major, major things. It replaces lost or damaged cells. That happens a lot. And you can look that up for independent work. How do we lose cells? How do we damage cells? It also plays a role in growth, because like I said, at one point in your life, you were just one cell. And now look at you. You're a lot bigger, right? That's because you've gone through growth. And then, of course, obviously, reproduction. And by reproduction in this context, I mean two organisms coming together to make another organism, right? Or for humans, as you might call it, sex. Any questions about this slide? Pretty simple stuff, right? You guys probably learn about all this. It gets a little bit more complicated when we start talking about what the chromosomes do, but for now, it's pretty pretty much a review of it. So this is a picture of what we talked about. Here's a kidney cell. Um, it's going through mitosis. It's splitting itself, right? It's making a new one. Again, this is a human embryo, so it started off as one cell, then it was two, then it was four, then it was eight, then it was 16, 32, 64, so on and so forth, right? It keeps doubling. And that's what you used to be. That's what I used to be. Sometimes, too, and we're going to talk about this later, so again, if you're writing stuff down, you don't need to write it down yet because I'm going to talk about it on the next slide, but asexual reproduction, too. So humans cannot asexually reproduce, right? We need a male and a female to get together, sperm and an egg, to make a baby. Some things can do asexual reproduction. <coughs> a lot of times, obviously, you would think single-celled organisms can do that, and amoebas are a good example. You can look that up for independent work. What are some other single cell organisms that do asexual reproduction? Sea stars are interesting because if you chop the arm off of a sea star, or starfish, whatever you want to call it, that arm will grow a new body. And then also, the one that you cut it off, you know, if you cut the arm off, then it'll grow a new arm. So that's asexual reproduction. You can also look into that. What are some other animals that, that do that? Sponge is one of them. And then there's the growth of a clipping, which I find fun. So if you did a plant, you know, you could have a plant that you pass down for generations and generations. It's like, oh, this is for my great great grandmother. And then you take a clip of it. If you do it right, it'll grow roots. And then you can maybe get that as a gift that the whole family has, you know, a, a genetic copy of the plant from your great great grandmother. Anyway, I'm not going to ask you if there's any questions yet because the next slide basically talks about this. It puts it in writing, asexual reproduction. You do need to know what asexual reproduction is. There will be questions about asexual reproduction. You need to know what it is. You need to know the difference between asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction. In asexual reproduction, there is no sperm and egg. In asexual reproduction, the parent and the offspring have identical genes. 
You could almost just call them clones. Because again, the parent basically clones itself. Now some might argue against that because there's a, a more technical definition for the word clone. But I think the way people generally use the term clone, you could definitely use it in that situation. For asexual reproduction, single cell order, excuse me, that's often, like I said, how single cell organisms reproduce. I'm going to put a star next to this because it's not how all single cell organisms reproduce. Actually, I put a star through that to remind you that you can look that up for independent work too. What are some of the single cell organisms that don't necessarily asexually reproduce? Um, but I'm also going to put next to this because I'm not going to have that on the exam, because there's some exceptions. So I don't want to ask you about that on the exam. But your book points out, too, that also many multicellular organisms go through asexual reproduction. And that was the picture I just showed you earlier, right? So the, the clippings, um, the starfish, things like that. And then again, I put others there, because that's a good independent work topic. What are some other multicellular organisms that do asexual reproduction? Anyway, are there any questions about asexual reproduction? All right, let's bring you to the next important one. And you don't necessarily need to write, well, uh, let's just jump into it. Mitosis. This is half of what we're going to talk about in this chapter. Mitosis is the cellular, cellular division that is responsible for asexual reproduction. You definitely need to know that. Mitosis is for asexual reproduction. And as you're going to learn later, Meiosis is for sexual reproduction. So mitosis is asexual, meiosis is sexual. In a stupid, kind of gross way to remember this, is the word mitosis, think, when you have sex, you know, for reproduction, you don't use your toes, right? I don't know what kind of kinks you're into, maybe you enjoy feet stuff, but you don't actually need the toes for sexual reproduction, right? So if you can remember that, you can remember mitosis is for asexual reproduction. And again, as we've already said earlier, asexual reproduction is used for the growth and maintenance of multicellular organisms. So, so again, for a lot of single cell organisms, that's just how they reproduce. But for us, for example, multicellular organisms, we go through mitosis. This is how we live. It's not how we produce new humans. So this is how we grow. This is how we maintain ourselves. You guys are probably going through mitosis right now, which is yet another independent work topic if you want to look into it. How often do you go through mitosis? At any given moment, how many cells in your body are going through mitosis? Something to, something to think about. Anyway, any questions about what mitosis is? All right, a lot of the exam, not a lot. But a portion of the exam is going to be knowing the stages of mitosis. And again, what we're mostly talking about is what happens to the chromosomes. So once we get to that point in the chapter, that's when you really should pay attention because that's what a lot of the exams are going to be about. Anyway, that's mitosis. That's asexual reproduction. Let's talk about the opposite of that. The opposite of that is sexual reproduction. And again, asexual reproduction doesn't require a sperm and an egg. Sexual reproduction does. That is the fertilization of an egg by a sperm. And here's a word you need to know, gamete. I will use that word. That is the generic term for an egg or a sperm. And producing this is accomplished by something called meiosis, like I already said. Meiosis is for sexual reproduction. Meiosis produces the sperm. Meiosis produces the egg. And then those things come together and then make a new baby, right? And this only happens in your reproductive organs. And if you want to look into that, this is also pretty interesting too for, um, for independent work, especially with females. Males are a little bit boring. We're just constantly making sperm. The story of how females make eggs is pretty interesting. I don't have time to get into it, but you could look into it. They're doing it from the get-go, basically. Anyway, are there any questions about this? All right, to wrap all that stuff up, everything we've just said, again, there are two types of cellular division for sexually reproducing, reproducing organisms like ourselves. <coughs> there's mitosis, for growth and maintenance, and there's meiosis, 
or reintroduction, right? So you need to know that. People will often get this messed up because I think pretty good people, when they study, they, they do a pretty good job of remembering mitosis is for asexual reproduction and meiosis is for sexual reproduction. They get that. But with it, what they then forget or they get confused with is we are sexually reproducing organisms, so they get the part that we do meiosis, but they forget that we also do mitosis, right? We don't do mitosis to reproduce new humans, but we do mitosis just to live. The same way people, I think, often forget that plants go through respiration, right? So it's always, you know, animal cells do respiration and plant cells do photosynthesis, which is a true statement, but also plant cells also do respiration, right? They have to have respiration. So don't, miss, don't mix that up. Sexually reproducing organisms do both types of cell division. Anyway, any questions <clears throat> about that? All right, that's the first main bullet point. That's the good news. The bad news is, I tell you, that first main bullet point is probably the easiest part of the chapter. So it's about to get a little bit more, more um, confusing. Not confusing, maybe uh, complicated. So what we're about to talk about are eukaryotic chromosomes. And I use this time to remind you of what eukaryotic means. So when we're talking about all the life on Earth, there's basically two types. There's eukaryotes and there's prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are the really basic things, like bacteria. Eukaryotes is pretty much everything else, the more complicated stuff, like animals, plants, protists, fungi. So we are talking about eukaryotic chromosomes, right? Because we are eukaryotes. Which also brings up yet another independent work topic if you want to look into it. Here, we're going to keep talking about mitosis and we're going to fo focus on these eukaryotic chromosomes. This is the story of how eukaryotes go through mitosis. But what about the other ones? What about bacteria? How do they do it? You can look that up for independent work if you want. Anyway, let's talk about these eukaryotic chromosomes because we're going to be talking about them for the next three chapters. Most of the genes in your cells are located on chromosomes in your nucleus. You probably already knew that. If you didn't, now you do. And you definitely need to know that for the exam. Like I said, most genes are found there. There are some exceptions. For example, the mitochondria that we talked about in chapter six, right, where respiration happens, they have their own genes. Which is interesting. Another thing you can look up for, for independent work. When you do those 23 and me, you know, DNA tests, they look at the mitochondrial DNA because it's really specific. You only get your mitochondrial DNA from your mom. Because sperm don't carry around the mitochondria. So you only get it from your mom. And then also your book points out that the same story for chloroplasts, right? So chloroplasts, they have their own DNA. So if you were looking at a plant cell, just like a human cell, it would have the nucleus, it would have chromosomes in it. But also, the chloroplasts have their own, their own um, genes. So any questions so far? All right, we'll talk about these first two. Each chromosome, we'll talk about your cells again. Each chromosome contains one long DNA molecule that has thousands of genes. Yet another thing you can look up for the more. For humans, how many genes does your average chromosome have? Have. Or if you want to look it up, and you're gonna to have to know this a little bit later, we have 23 pairs of genes, uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes. So you can look up how many genes are on chromosome number one, how many genes are located on chromosome number two, all the way into the end. And this is something you don't need to know, but it's slightly interesting, I think. I'm gonna put an X to it. But the chromosome number depends on species. And I'm gonna show you that right now. Oops. All right, so for example, like I said, humans have 46 chromosomes. And to me, this is slightly interesting because you look at something like a rat. This rat here has 102 chromosomes. Meanwhile, something a lot larger, like this particular species of deer, only has six. So I don't know. I find that interesting. And of course, I'm going to put a big X to this because you certainly do not need to memorize this. But this is also yet another topic for independent work if you're interested in it. You just pick your favorite plant or your favorite animal and just look it up. How many chromosomes is it? You like cats or dogs or snakes, particular species of snake. We'll look it up. Anyway, any questions about this slide? All right, the next word for attendance will be 
dog. Since it's up there. The word dog. Here we go. Chromosomes are made up of something called chromatin. I'm going to put it next to this just to indicate that I'm not going to ask you what chromatin is on the exam. But I am going to use the word in the lecture, so you need to know what it is when I use it. But I'm not going to ask you what it is on the exam. Chromatin is usually thin fibers that are much longer than the nucleus. So again, you've got 46 uh, chromosomes, 23 pairs of them, all squished into the nucleus. And they're actually a lot longer than the nucleus itself, which makes sense because remember at the beginning of the, of the chapter, I showed you that picture of the lady with the DNA next to her. And your book said that one DNA molecule, if you were to stretch it out, <coughs> is longer than you. So obviously, 46 of them are going to be a lot longer too. Chromatin is made up of about the same amount of DNA and protein. So we usually think of chromosomes as DNA because that's the most important part, you know, for what we study anyway. But yeah, it also has protein. And the fact that it has protein will be important a little bit later on, not necessarily in this chapter, but those, the protein that make up the, uh, the chromosomes, that's important stuff a little bit later. Because the proteins help organize the chromatin and they control the activities of the genes. And again, for now, that's not important. I'm even going to put it next to that because I'm not going to ask you that. But later, that's going to come back. When we talk about how genes work, right? Because genes are just basically in, uh, instructions on how to build stuff for your cells, how to build, how to build stuff in your cells. And you can't always have them on, right? You don't need them when you need a particular thing to be built. We'll talk about that later. But anyway, you need ways of turning your genes on and off, basically. And these proteins do that, and that will be important later. So your book says that a fully extended DNA molecule is over six feet long. So again, think about that. That's just one DNA molecule when you have 46 of them in each cell, and you have trillions of cells in your body. So think about how much DNA is in your body. If you were to stretch each one of them out, how far would it go? Good independent work topic. As we already know, sort of, when the cells are ready to divide, the chromosomes have to get ready, right? We said that earlier, but now let's get a little bit more specific. How do they do that? The chromosomes coil up, and they form compact structures that can be seen with microscopes. And I'm going to put it next to this, not because you don't need to know it, but because we're going to talk about it again. When we talk about mitosis specifically, when we really get into it, this is going to come up again. So you do need to know that, but for now, I just want to throw it out there like, yep, now you know. Later it'll be important, but for now it's just an introduction. So. This next slide, well, actually, are there any questions about this slide before I move forward and show you a picture of what we're talking about? All right, so here's a bunch of cells. You know, you look at this one. This thing is not preparing for mitosis, right? It's an interphase, and you're going to learn about interphase later. So you can't look at that and say, oh, yeah, that's a chromosome, that's a chromosome, right? It's just a big squiggly mess. You can't see it. Here, you can see these purple-looking sausages, right? That's what it looks like to me. And those are chromosomes, right? So that thing is getting ready to go through mitosis. It is ready to go through cellular reproduction. So for that reason, the chromosomes have to coil up. And later, I'll talk about why that's important that the chromosomes coil up for that process. And why it's important that they're uncoiled when they're not going through that. But for now, you just need to know they do coil up before they go through mitosis. <clears throat> Excuse me. Are there any questions so far? All right, some other words you need to know, because I'm going to use them, not because they're going to be on the exam. I think they, there are questions about this on the study guide. But histones and nucleosomes, you need to know that. DNA is packed into elaborate multi-level systems. Basically, it coils up, it folds upon itself. Part of the things that does that are these histones, which are the proteins that are used to package the DNA. So earlier, one of the slides I showed you not too long ago, I said that chromatin is made up of about half DNA and half protein, right? Well, now your book gets a little bit more specific. That protein, those are called histones. Now, when the DNA itself, the DNA molecule itself, wraps around <coughs> those histones, then that is called a nucleosome. But again, like I said, I will not ask you questions about this on the exam, so for that reason, I will put it next to this. You do need to know what it is because I will use those words. 
but I'm not going to ask you about it on the exam. The next slide I'm going to show you is a picture of all this that we're talking about. So before I show you the picture, does anybody have any questions about what I've said so far? All right, there's the DNA double helix. I'm sure you guys have seen this drawing all the time. So that's what it looks like. Again, when it wraps around those histones, we call that a nucleosome, right? So each one of those little things is called a nucleosome. That's how it's wound up. And then those things themselves coil up. And that might look really squiggly, but if you look closely, it's not random. So those histones, those nucleosomes, those coil in a spiral. And then you have like that big rope of spiral, right? And then even those things have a pattern that look like that. And then of course, that's what leads us to the condensed chromosome. That's what a chromosome looks like when it's all wound up. And again, like I said, this only happens before mitosis, right? Before it goes through cellular reproduction, <coughs> all the chromosomes have to get wound up. They're not always like that. And we'll talk about why a little bit later. So any questions about this picture? That's the whole thing at once. No? All right. We're we'll moving right along. Let's talk about duplicating chromosomes. Because again, when we talk about mitosis and meiosis in this chapter, a lot of things are happening, right? These cells are dividing, they're duplicating themselves. But what we're mostly focused on in this story is what's happening to the chromosomes. Again, before the cell can divide, the DNA has to be copied, right? That's how your book is wording it in this portion of the chapter. It's basically saying the same thing we've already said, except last time we said the DNA, um, or excuse me, the chromosomes need to duplicate, right? Another way of saying that is the DNA has to be copied. So the result of this is that the chromosomes will consist of two copies called sister chromatids. This is very, very important. You need to know what a sister chromatid is. So if you have this one chromosome, there's your one chromosome, it's condensed, but then it's about to duplicate, right? The cell's about to duplicate, so the chromosome has to duplicate. And what happens is it makes a perfect copy of itself. And I'm not a good drawer, but there we go. So now we have two sister chromatids, and they're attached. So you got this one on the left, and the one on the right are perfect genetic copies of each other. Of course, not the way I drew it, because again, it looks like garbage, but the idea is the same. Where are they connected? They're connected to something called the centromere. So that's that little, that's that little round spot that I tried to draw right there. That's the centromere. This is very important. You need to know what sister chromatids are. Not only will I use this word a lot, but it will be on the exam. Also, when we talk about mitosis, we always talk about the sister chromatids. That's all we talk about. And then when we get a little bit more complicated and start talking about meiosis, then we still talk about sister chromatids, but then I'm going to introduce you to another word. And one of, the, one of the big things you need to do for this exam is to be able to differentiate between mitosis and meiosis. And this is one of the big ones. Because again, in mitosis, we only talk about sister chromatids. And then meiosis, as you'll see, is a, is a different version. So are there any questions about what sister chromatids are? Here's a better picture. Here you have the one, this is what I tried to draw. This is the one chromosome, it's just doing its own thing. But then it's like, uh oh, I'm about to go through mitosis, I need to duplicate myself. So it does. So now we have two sister chromatids. Of course, that picture doesn't really show the centromere. So I'll go ahead and draw that in. <coughs> there we go, there's a the centromere. So that's it, right? The chromosomes duplicate, and the result is two sister chromatids. And they are perfect copies of each other. You need to know that. So then what happens when the cell divides, those sister chromatids divide, right? They separate. And once separated, each sister chromatid is then considered a full-fledged chromosome. So again, when they're attached to each other, they're called sister chromatids. <clears throat> but once they're separated, they're just regular old chromosomes. And again, like I said earlier, they are identical to the original chromosomes. They are perfect copies of each other. And this is what I'm talking about. This is what it looks like. So well, you already saw this first part of the picture. This chromosome is just hanging out, doing its thing. It's about to go through cellular reproduction, so it duplicates itself. So now we have two sister chromatids attached to each other at the centromere. They're perfect copies of each other. Then it actually goes through reproduction. The cell goes through reproduction. And what happens is those chromosomes, excuse me, those sister chromatids separate, at which point we now have two brand new chromosomes. Um, 
each of which are a perfect copy of each other. Pretty simple, right? It's going a little bit, and it'll get a little bit more complicated because when we talk about going from this phase to this phase, it's actually quite a few steps that you need to know. But for now, that's pretty simple. The next word for attendance will be sister. There it is. All right. Now let's talk about the cell cycle. Now we're really starting to get into it. It's kind of like we have all the background information now. Now we're really going to talk about how this works. Cell cycle. Now, I'm probably not going to ask you the definition of the cell cycle. You're just going to need to know the different parts of the cell cycle. And we'll get to that in a second. But the definition of the cell cycle or the explanation from your book, it is the ordered sequence of events from when the first or excuse me, when the cell is first formed, if you want to call it the birth of the cell, you can call it that, until it divides again. So for the cell cycle, you can almost think of it as the life cycle, the lifetime of the cell. Unlike us, right? From humans, you think, all right, you started when the sperm met the egg, right? And then you end when you die. For cells, it's different. It's from when the cell is first born, so to speak, until it reproduces and splits. And again, the next slide I'm going to show you is pictures of this. But for now, are there any questions about what the cell cycle is? All right, now we're really getting into some test questions here. You need to know the cell cycle. You need to know that the cell cycle goes G1, S phase, G2, and the mitotic phase. You need to know that in order. Know those in order. What is the stopping? What's that? Which is the Starts with G1. And hopefully the easy way to remember that is because of the, you know, it's the one that has number one next to it. The hard part sometimes is remembering that S phase comes between G1 and G2. To me, logically, you would think G1, G2, and then something else, but it doesn't work like that. It goes G1, and then S phase, and then G2. And we're going to talk about what happens in each of these phases. First thing I want to talk about in general is this big one. And I know this is going to be sound complicated because I just told you that the cell cycle is G1, S, G2, and then the mitotic phase. But we kind of break it down. So the first thing I want to talk about is those first three. The first three, which is G1, S, and G2, that whole thing is called interphase. So maybe I can write it down like this. There's two different ways we can look at it. The cell cycle <coughs> is broken down into interphase and mitotic phase, right? That's it. That is what the cell cycle is. You can see right here, here's interphase, right? And then here's the mitotic phase. So you can look at it that way. The cell cycle is interphase or the mitotic phase. Then, of course, you can break it down, which we kind of already have. The interphase itself is made up of G1, S phase, and G2. So please don't let that confuse you. As a whole, the cell cycle was interphase or the mitotic phase. And then if we were to look at interphase, we would see that we can also break that down into G1, S, and G2. Likewise, when we get to it, the mitotic phase is also going to be broken down into different stages. So everybody gets that, right? There's two main parts, interphase and mitotic phase. And the interphase itself is broken down into those three phases. And you do need to know this number. I'm not big into numbers. I don't know. Maybe not necessarily the number, per se. But you should know that a cell spends a large majority of its time in interphase, right? Because when it's in interphase, it's just doing its thing. So when a kidney cell is doing its kidney thing, Brain cells are doing the brain thing, you know, lung cells are doing the lung thing, whatever it is that the cells do, that's what they do in interphase. Of course, once they get to the S phase, and you need to know this, this is some new information you need to know, that's when they duplicate. Actually, we can get to that on the next slide, I'm sorry, I won't even tell you that yet. Just for now, know that the cell cycle is broken down into interphase, 
in the mitotic phase, and the interphase is the big one, right? That's where they spend most of the time. Now, when you read about mitosis, you often hear about interphase, right? You'll hear interphase, and then they'll talk about different portions of mitosis because that is a part of the story. But interphase itself is not a part of mitosis. It's completely distinct. Anyway, let's talk about a part of interphase, which is called S phase. Right, so again, interphase itself is broken down into three phases, G1, S, G2. Now we're going to talk about S phase. Because as far as we're concerned, S phase is the only important one. Because this is a discussion about cellular reproduction. So we don't care what's happening in G1 or G2. What we care about is what it's going to get ready to reproduce. And that is what happens in the S phase. That is when the chromosomes duplicate. And I'm going to put a star next to that because you need to know it. If you don't know anything else about S phase, you need to know that. That is when the, cell, the chromosomes duplicate. So that whole conversation we had earlier about chromosomes duplicating with that little pinkish purple chromosome that I showed you that doubled itself, that's where it happens, right? That is S phase of interphase. You need to know that. And again, like I said, with this bullet point right here, regarding cellular reproduction, which is the only thing we're even talking about in this chapter, that is the most important event of interphase. So again, if you were studying kidney cells, because that's what you, maybe you would look at in the, I don't know, kidney cancer. So for you, you might be really interested in G1 or G2. But for us, since we're studying cellular reproduction, the only thing we really care, care about is S phase. And the easy way to remember that S phase is when the chromosomes duplicate is because the S is for DNA synthesis, right? That is when we make the DNA. Any questions about S phase? All right, let's talk about the other two parts of interphase, which are G1 and G2. We'll go ahead and put a big old X to this because I'm not going to ask you anything about it. But the G stands for gap. That might help you remember that it's G1 and then S phase and then G2. It's kind of the gap between the mitotic phase and the S phase. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I'm not going to ask any questions about this. If you want to, you can look it up for independent work. What exactly happens in G1? What exactly happens in G2? But we are not concerned for this course. Any questions about that side? All right, that's it for interphase. Like I said, the whole cell cycle is broken down into two phases, interphase and mitotic phase. So now we're no longer talking about interphase here. Now we're talking about that little sliver called the mitotic phase. The mitotic phase itself is broken down into two main portions. There's mitosis and there's cytokinesis, and they kind of overlap with each other. Everything else we talked about kind of happens sequentially. These two things, you can think of them as mitosis and then cytokinesis. That would suffice for the exam. But in your mind, just keep in mind that these things kind of overlap. So as mitosis is ending, cytokinesis has already started. But we'll talk about that in more detail when we talk about mitosis. But yes, big picture here to remind you, the whole cell cycle was broken down into the interphase and the mitotic phase. We already talked about interphase. So now we're looking at the mitotic phase, and I'm telling you the mitotic phase itself is broken down into mitosis and cytokinesis. And if that's not complicated enough for you, I'm about to break it down even more and tell you that mitosis itself is broken down into four stages. And we'll talk about that. But again, I want to be clear with this. Mitosis is not a part of interphase, right? So it's interphase or the mitotic phase. These things are not together. They're separate. Anyway, mitosis is when the nucleus and its contents divide into two daughter nuclei. I'll put it next to this, not because you don't need to know that, but because we're going to talk so much about mitosis, and we're going to talk about each different phase, that I don't care that you don't need to know the definition of mitosis. You need to know what happens in each stage. So obviously, you're going to know by the end of it, the nucleus and its contents divide. But that's not enough. You need to know exactly how they divide and what stages and what the stages are going. Cytokinesis is when the cytoplasm, including everything that's in it, so the cell itself, basically divides into two. So what we're talking about here, a big picture, if we're talking about the mitotic phase, mitosis is when the nucleus basically duplicates, right? The nucleus and everything that's in it, right? So the nucleus and the chromosomes. Cytokinesis is the whole cell. So we're talking about nuclear division and cellular division. 
And what you need to know, one, one of the other things you need to know, mitosis produces two genetically identical daughter cells. You need to know that for the exam. Because again, like I said, you're gonna also gonna have to differentiate between mitosis and meiosis. And I'm gonna give you this information a little bit later, but I'll go ahead and tell you now. Meiosis produces four genetically unique daughter cells as opposed to two genetically identical daughter cells. So you do need to differentiate between mitosis and meiosis upon many things, but this is the first one I told you about. Well, the second one I told you about. The first one was that mitosis is for asexual reproduction and meiosis is for sexual reproduction. So any questions about this slide? I know it's five minutes early, but I think that's a good place to stop. So when we get back on Wednesday, then we'll finally jump into what's actually happening during mitosis and cytokinesis. So the last word for today will be cancer. And we are done five minutes early. I'll be online for office hours if you need me. Don't forget, you can get extra credit just for showing up and letting me give you feedback and tell you how you're doing and what you could improve on and, you know, all that stuff. Oh, yeah. If you come with Bob, yeah, if you come with Bob, I can show you, or maybe I'll let him tell you more. Just well, two things, and I guess everybody should hear this. Uh, with independent work, whenever I grade something, I always tell you. So I say, hey, you earned seven points, your total is now this. So I do tell you each time, but also I want to show you if you want how to get it on the on that spreadsheet. So you never have to ask, you never have to guess, you can always look it up. <clears throat>